Romans chapter 8. One of the great chapters in all the Bible. And there are a lot of great ones, obviously. Uh, but we've taken a break from our study of the uh, dynamic doctrines uh, for a little while, I guess since right before Memorial Day and Memorial Day on, we've been doing a lot of patriotic stuff and 50th anniversary of the moon landing and all these other things. But I want to get back into the end of this study and resume it. Now, I guess we got to go all the way back now to kind of <laughs> talk about where we've been, just kind of jog your memory a little bit. But the, with these dynamic doctrines, uh, we talked a bit about God the Father, the fact that God is light and God is love, and God is Lord. So we talked about the holiness of God, the love of God. We talked about the sovereignty of God, the fact that He's Lord. And then we talked about uh, God the Son. And we talked a, a bit about um, how He sovereignly limited His own divine attributes to become a human being live a life like we live and yet without sin and then give his life as a sacrifice on the cross to take our place in our punishment uh, for our sins. Raised from the dead, ascended back to the right hand of the Father and now intercedes for you and me. Uh, he's praying for us which is a great encouragement. Uh, but then we uh, talked a bit about God the Holy Spirit. We didn't do everything about God the Spirit. We didn't talk about the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. We didn't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit other than His role in our salvation. How He is the one who convicts of sin and of righteousness of judgment. How He is the one who draws people to Jesus Christ. He lifts people, He lifts Jesus up and draws people to Christ. And without that drawing, you can't be saved. <laughs> okay? God has to operate. He has to operate. He has to issue the invitation. He works through the gospel message preached. The Holy Spirit brings that to life in your heart, convicts you of your sin, draws you to Christ. So you can't be saved anytime you want to. You're saved when the Spirit of God draws you to him and that's that's Bible we know that John 644 no man can come to me unless the father draw him first got it okay so we went through all those scriptures and we will agree I guess at that point with those who subscribe to these reformed doctrines and Calvinism at that one point about the drawing of the Holy Spirit um, pre preparatory preparatory to salvation now um, then we talked about the creation and the fall, and here's where we diverged from uh, the Calvinists uh, very sharply on that, because we talked about the fact that we are created in the image of God and in His likeness, and we know that God is a, is a, is a God who makes decisions. He makes choices, right? He chose to make us, and he chose to make us with a free will. The ability to make choices and decisions like he does, right? And we know that Adam and Eve, when they had that opportunity to make a choice, when it came to uh, naming the animals, uh, I guess, you know, Adam did okay, but when it came to him making a choice uh, about whether to eat that fruit that God said you can't eat, that he and Eve made a bad choice. They sinned against God. And, and here's where we diverge from the Calvinists, or at least I do, biblically. And that is that they believe that when Adam and Eve sinned, that their will was so damaged and basically destroyed that they, had, that they, were, they could no longer hear God. They could no longer respond to God in a saving sense. Um, and we saw very clearly that when God came and said, Hey, where are you, Adam? He answered. He could hear God and he could respond to God. Now, I'm no way saying that, that Adam and Eve could save themselves. We know a little bit later after that interchange that God did something for them, didn't he? Remember, they were naked. They knew it. They were shamed. They made, uh, you know, uh, a fig leaf bikini and suit or whatever they made. I don't know. They, they covered themselves with fig leaves, as we all, we all say it. They covered themselves. Uh, but it was God who had to cover them. And how did he cover them? Through the shedding of blood, right? There was an animal that had to die uh, to give, give its skin 
skin to cover their sin, if you will. Okay, And so we believe, though, that, that they still could respond. They could hear God. They could respond to God. But that redemption was something they could not accomplish. Now, we agree with the Calvinists on that. We, it's not <laughs> Salvation is not our work, right? It's His, and it's a finished work. Uh, and we know that, right? So we talked a bit about uh, the impact of the fall uh, biblically. And, and again, this is all preparation for coming up to uh, a study through the five doctrines of Calvinism. T-U-L-I-P is what they call TULIP. Uh, Calvin didn't come up with TULIP. That's way later. Uh, but it, pretty, it does really uh, sum up uh, his doctrines of grace, the Reformed uh, doctrine that is now just growing by leaps and bounds in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, your president, uh, you know, of the convention, elected annually, uh, subscribes to this belief. Most of the seminary professors uh, and presidents subscribe to this belief, and most of the preachers that are now coming out of the seminary subscribe to these beliefs. And so, it's good for us to understand what they are. Um, and we'll get to that, but what I've done is laid the foundation by looking at the Bible, not the system. So that when we look at the system, you'll be able to identify it. Now, I'm going to give you a few quotes today, as I've been a little along. I've been dropping a few choice quotes from Calvin on you, and we'll do that again today. Uh, so that you can see very clearly the difference in what they believe and what the Bible says. And that's key uh, for us to do, I believe. So we looked at the creation and the fall. We looked at salvation by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We all agree on that, that faith is what uh, activates uh, God's salvation. Now, we did remember, we diverged there too, because the Calvinists believe that God gives you the faith, that faith is a part of the gift and you'll remember that I told you that um, in the Greek, you could go either way with that, um, whether grace is the gift, which we know it is, or grace and faith are the gifts. You could go either way with that. But even John Calvin, in his commentary on Ephesians 2, said, no, no, faith is not the gift at that point, which was very interesting to me, and I thought it, it might have been interesting to you as well. But anyway, we, we diverged with Calvinists at that point. We do not believe that faith is a gift, uh, that faith is, is something that ultimately you, you, you're responsible for. He doesn't just push that on you. I guess faith is a gift from the perspective of the fact that he gives us the opportunity to believe, and I guess in and of itself that is a gift, and we could say it that way. Um, but faith's not a work either, and that's what the Calvinists would say. If you exercise faith, you're working for your salvation. No. Paul says it again and again, contrasting works with faith. And we looked at Romans 4 and went through the whole chapter and showed you without a shadow of a doubt that he that Paul does not present faith as a work he, he presents it as opposite of works it's simply receiving the gift that God has given you in the person of Jesus Christ and then we talked about yes we're, we're talking about Calvinism again and I'm really curious because I was outside the Baptist Church for about 15 years mm -hmm. before I never heard anything about Calvinism now right. back in the Baptist Church Right. And I'm hearing all this stuff about Calvinism. Yeah. It's not just the Baptist church, though. It, I mean, it, it, has, it is a phenomenon. I mean, it, it, is, it is a growing thing, not just in Baptist life, but I mean, all through all denominations. I got friends in the Calvary Chapel movement uh, that I you know, preach in their churches, and so they're having here, trouble what, with it. What percent of the Baptist churches or Calvinism. Okay, uh, let me let me answer that. That's why we're talking about this yeah. because 30% of the churches, and this is a Lifeway uh, study, and your pastor Dean Hahn showed this up on the screen. 30% would be categorized as Reformed or Calvinist in their perspective, but 70% of the seminary students who are coming out of the seminaries and into the churches to lead them 
are Calvinist and Reformed. And so there is going to be a mighty sea change that is coming where they're going to overwhelm the convention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. That's why we're doing this. I'm not doing it just for fun. I'm doing it because it is a real, to me, a real threat uh, to historic Southern Baptist biblical belief about how we are saved so that's why we're doing this okay and it's his fault if you want to blame somebody it's his fault right back there ernie no <laughs> no i'm, I'm, I'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding in our area we weekly do battle with good christian folk. yes these are not lost people good christian folk who are being deceived yeah. by this doctrine or ideology or ever what you'd call yeah. it, that they quote you scripture as easy oh, as yeah. you breathe. But, uh, they just, just like a Jehovah's Witness, see. man, they can pull the scripture out on you. They really can. Selective. And I and I use that phrase very carefully. But it's got to be selective with scripture. Yes, yeah. it, it is. It is. And that's why we're looking at a broad uh, group of scriptures. But today we're going to look at one of the scriptures that they are just, this is this is one of their big scriptures right here. Okay, so we're going to look at it. We're going to start looking at it. We'll get we'll get more in depth as we go. Uh, but we did talk about election. That is one of their big things that you are chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved or lost. Right? Remember John Calvin? I gave you the quote. I mean, it's just it's a killer quote as to what he believes is that before you were born, before before you could even have a chance to hear the gospel, before you were a twinkle in your mom and daddy's eye. God had already made the decision about you, whether you're going to be damned or whether you're going to be saved. That's Calvin's view. That's the Reformed view. And I'm, to me, that, that says a lot about the character and nature of God that I just cannot accept. But, uh, and, and about the scriptures, obviously, that contradict them. And we talked about the fact that, yes, God does elect, but whom did he elect? Whom did he choose? Who was the chosen one? Jesus. Jesus was chosen, right? Before He was chosen. He was slain before the foundation of the world. He is predetermined, if you will. But it is by virtue of your faith in him that you are incorporated into his body and you become the elect. And if you read Ephesians 2, you know, Ephesians 1, of course, talks about the election. But you read Ephesians 2, he talks about the fact that you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's like you're at the right hand of the Father by virtue of your faith in him. You're incorporated into the person of Christ. And so you're there with Jesus at the right hand of the Father by virtue of your faith. It's a corporate reality election is. Election is not individualistic, particularistic when it comes to salvation. When it comes to service, it is. You got all kinds of people being chosen for certain things in the Old Testament, whether it's Cyrus, uh, he was chosen and raised up uh, for, his, for God's purposes, Pharaoh raised up for God's purposes, uh, but God did not counter their, he only took what was already there and, and furthered it. So we can talk about individualistic, particularistic election when it comes to God choosing people to serve a purpose, whether it was a king, uh, whether it's a prophet. Uh, but when it comes to salvation, we need to talk about election as Jesus being the elect. And then by virtue of us choosing Jesus by faith, we are put in his body, the church. And in that sense, we can be spoken of as the elect right so that's and that was a whole big lesson and some of you are glazing over at this point so I'll move on all right so let, let me uh, let me move on to uh, what we what we're looking at today there are three things in this passage that the, that they go wild on they love this kind of language um, foreknowledge predestination and calling then there's justification and glorification but this this is what the Calvinist calls, the Reformed theologian calls, the golden chain of redemption. And they basically say that, that this, you know, this is how it happens. And they have their own interpretations for each of these words that we're looking at right now on the screen. And uh, they don't match up with biblical truth that we find elsewhere, but they fill them with their own meaning. So we, we have the same 
uh, word, but we use a different dictionary. Does that make sense? We have the same word between us, us and Calvinists, but they, we use a different dictionary. There's different meaning that they attach to these words. And you're going to see that as we go forward. Now let's look at the scripture itself. It's one of the most familiar scriptures in all the Bible. And we all love Romans 8, 28, don't we? You know, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Predestined to, to do what? To be saved? Notice this, uh, to be conformed to the image of his Son. So there's sanctification as the predestination there. That he might be the firstborn, Jesus, among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So, he sets out uh, from the beginning, what he you know that that hear that he's talking to believers. How do we know that he's talking to believers? Verse twenty-eight: Those who what love God, they love God. Okay, so we're talking to believers right here. We're not talking to unbelievers. Uh, and no, and notice, you know, he's talking about the circumstances that come into our lives. Not necessarily that God, you know, sends things that we would consider evil into our lives. He allows them maybe. Sometimes he does put them in our lives. Um, but they're always for what? Our good. Yeah. And, and his glory. I mean, he's working things. He's engineering things for our good and his glory, whether it's the present trials that we have with our children or our grandchildren, whether it's, you know, dealing with cancer in our family. I mean, what you know, doesn't matter what it is that we're dealing with, God is going to engineer all of those circumstances, good, bad, and otherwise, somehow for our good. For our good. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, our stuff, job, finances, the uh, you know, depression, whatever it is we're, we're dealing with at the current time, it, whatever circumstance it is, God has either divinely allowed it or decreed it, and He's working it for our good. And, um, you know, it, and, and that's, that is a tremendous message. This, this is an uplifting passage. I don't know if you've read the rest of the... Well, I know you have. You've read the rest of Romans 8, haven't you? Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? This is just an encouraging passage here. It's one of the most encouraging in all the Bible. But in the midst of this word of encouragement that he's giving us here, we got a lot of doctrinal truth. And, and so I, I, could, I could speak all about the encouragement here, but I want us to go and look at the doctrine, okay, which is not nearly as much fun. Okay, I grant you that. <laughs> it's not as much fun, but it's necessary as we're building these blocks uh, for the case that we're making here. And so as you, as you look at verses 29 and 30, I'm calling this the five pillars of redemption here. They call it the golden chain of redemption. I'm calling it the five pillars. But these pillars really rest on, on, the, on the work of Almighty God, and it's really the house on which salvation stands. And they rest on the eternal purposes of God the Father, the finished work of God the Son, and the ongoing work of the Spirit of God in each of us to bring us to that place of completion because here you see it's like get have you ever uh, something I'm, I, I like to see now um, is, is sometimes I'll look at um, I'll look at a piece of property in Montana and I love when they they'll take a drone and, and, and you and the thing will take off the ground and the only thing you can see is just a bunch of dark pine tree forest okay you can't see a thing but once that drone lifts up over the top of that forest and boom, you've got this vista of, you know, mountain stacked on mountain, stacked on mountain with snow-capped peaks and blue skies and clouds. But, it, but on the ground, you couldn't see anything. I mean, grass right in front of you, dark trees, you know, you couldn't see anything. But once that thing cleared, whoo, 
Ooh, then you could you got the whole view. That's what God's doing right here. He's giving us the entire sweeping panorama of salvation from beginning all the way to the end. From from the foreknowledge, God knowing what you're going to do with, with Jesus, to the end when you are glorified when Jesus comes back again. I mean, this is an amazing passage of Scripture here that, that we have in front of us. And so I want us to see this uh, from that divine perspective, the, the, uh, not the bird's eye view, but the God's eye view, if you will, um, of, of how God looks at it. So let's look at it then, uh, the first one, and that is the supreme wisdom of God, for whom he foreknew, right? That's the word that he's using here, uh, for whom, whom he did foreknow, King James. Um, and that's what I'm calling the supreme wisdom of God. God's wisdom is unlike any other wisdom, right? His knowledge is like no other uh, knowledge. He's not a man. He's not bound by time. He sees everything. He, you know, the Bible says he sees the end from the beginning, right? He, he, he's not bound by time at all. And so uh, the theologians, they, they use another word. It's one of those omni words. Remember, remember that? We talked about it earlier omnipresent that means he's everywhere all the time what's another one omnipotent, omnipotent that he's all-powerful right and then omniscient. omniscient right what does that mean he knows everything has all knowledge does that knowledge extend to the past absolutely present absolutely future yes it does he, he sees and knows everything he knows everything that will happen he even knows what might happen it's amazing his his knowledge and so this word that is used in the greek you see it on the screen we we get that don't we prognosco uh, we get our word prognosis or prognostication um, you know the weathermen for example that they, they make a prognostication I ain't very good about doing that around here. You know, my wife is like, well, they said it was going to rain today, but we're going to have to water the garden because it didn't rain, right? Where is she anyway? She's not even in here. But she ditched me today, I guess. I don't know. I brought her to church. Uh, I heard about one weatherman had to leave one town and go to another because the weather didn't agree with him. You know, I mean, he <laughs> Anyway, but sometimes the doctor will make a prognosis, right? Yeah. He'll tell you, you keep on this path and this is what's going to happen. But if you'll take my advice and you'll follow this regimen that I've got for you, uh, which, uh, you know, my doctor told me some real straight things the last time I visited with him. Not that I had problems, but I was going to have problems if I didn't follow what he said for me to do, right? Made a, pro uh, a prognosis. And he says, if you'll do this, you'll get better. If you do that, you're going to get worse. But sometimes the doctor's wrong. I heard about it. One doctor said to the man, he said, you got a year to live. And that'll be $1,000. Uh -huh. He said, well, I don't have $1,000. He said, well, I'm going to give you another year to live so you can give me that money. <laughs> so he, he, sometimes the doctor's wrong. But no, God's prognosis, God's foreknowledge is not based on a guess or a whim. Um, you know, God knows things before they happen. You say, well, I don't understand that. You don't have to. You just need to trust it. That's what the Bible teaches. Says that he does, so he does. It's a matter of fact, and you see it proven again and again and again. Whether it's prophecies that he puts in the mouths of prophets that then come true, years and years down the road I mean just think of Jesus all the prophecies about the Lord Jesus the first coming of Jesus 333 verses of scripture 433 facts given by all those different prophets across different ages from Genesis 315 all the way through Malachi and they every one of them come through, come true every one of them comes true you don't believe God has foreknowledge there's your proof right there you know you you tell a skeptic you know he says well I don't I don't know that I believe in the Word of God you just give them that right there and then they're going to be confounded because it's true so 
you know, again, it's it's kind of like the drone thing. I mean, it's it's you know, if you wanted to watch a parade, you you see the see one float coming at you on the ground. Uh, but if you were to get the drone up there and watch you know, on the camera, you could see the first float, the last float, and everything in between because you can go up 1,000, 2,000 feet to see the whole deal. That's the way God is. He's got the whole view. He sees the beginning. He sees the end. He sees everything in between all at one time because he is timeless. He's not bound by time like we are. Now, because he knows something is going to happen, before it happens, does that mean that he determined it to happen? Okay, now here's where we're going to diverge with these folks by the name of Calvin, okay? All right, let's look at what he says here, just so you can have a little fun today and say, I learned some Calvin today. Look at this. Well, we rightly say that God foresees all things, even as he disposes of them, but it is confusing, uh, confusing everything to say that God elects and rejects according to his foresight of this and that. When we attribute, attribute foreknowledge to God, we mean that all things have always been and internally remain under observation so that nothing is either future or past to his knowledge. Okay, we've talked about that. He sees and regards them in the truth as though they were before his face. And we say, say that this foreknowledge extends throughout the circuit of the world and over all his creatures. Okay, so far we're, we're kind of okay with them. We're a little wary, but we're okay. But now, here we go. But since God sees things to come for no other reason that he has, than that he has determined that they should come, it is folly to dispute and debate what his prescience is doing when it is apparent that everything occurs by his ordinance, that is, his direct decree, his command, and disposition. Now, he's quoting somebody there, and you can see the guy he's quoting at the bottom. He is not denying that distinction, but on the contrary, maintaining the difference of the nature between foreknowledge and predestination. Foreknowledge has for its object the decisions of the divine will. Predestination is identical with that will. So for Calvin, foreknowledge equals predestination. So if God knows something is going to happen in the future, that means that he has declared that it will happen in the future. Now, if, if, if I hold this out here, and I'm not going to drop it because I, you know, I have to pay for that. That wouldn't be fun. But if, but if I drop this, would you say that you knowing that I was going to drop it, determined that I dropped it? No, it just, I just dropped it, you know. You, you knew it was going to happen because I told you I was about to. You believed me, but you didn't make me, did you? All right, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you a scripture that I think will illustrate this. I'm going to have to, let me, let me pull my, I didn't, I didn't put this in here, but I just love this, this scripture because it blows up their argument completely. All right, so check this out. Look, look at this scripture. You got your Bibles, 1 Samuel 23. Um, this is, David is um, running from Saul. Okay, Saul is after him. He's trying to kill him. And uh, David um, is, uh, you know, trying to evade Saul. The Philistines are, you know, active at this point. And so he's, he's asking God some questions. And the prophet gives him some answers. But I want you to see this. Check this out. 1 Samuel 23. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Kilah, and they're robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? So he's asking God a question, right? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Kilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we're afraid here in Judah, how much more then if we go to Kilah against the armies of the Philistines? And David inquired of the Lord once again. The Lord answered him, said, Arise, go down to Kilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Okay, God's got knowledge that if he goes down there, he's going to beat them. Okay, that's foreknowledge, right? He knows what will happen in the future. If David goes down there, 
he'll beat them. And David and his men went to Kyle and fought the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow and took away their livestock. Guess what? He saw it happen. It happened, right? God, what God said came to pass. So David saved the inhabitants of Kyla, but I'm not done. You thought it was over, right? Oh, no. Check this out. Now, it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, this is a priest, fled to David at Kyla, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. Y'all remember that? We studied Leviticus. The ephod was the way of determining and discerning the will of God. It was kind of holy roller dice. Off the ephod, you pulled the stones off and basically rolled them. You got a yes or a no answer, right? Sorry, but that's the crude method that they had, and God worked through that. You know, the lap's thrown in, in, in or the dice is thrown in the lap, but the, every decision is from the Lord, Proverbs says, okay? Um, you could look that up, but I can't remember chapter and verse on that one. My apologies. But that is true. God still makes the decision regardless of these crude means. So, he asked him the question. He, and it says, uh, and Saul was told that David had gone to Kyla, and so Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he shut himself up by entering a town that has gates and bars. Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Kyla to besiege David and his men. Now when David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Pithar the priest, here we go. Third question. Bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord uh, God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Kilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Kilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. So, prognostication is happening here. God foresees that if I stay here, Saul's coming. And then David asked a second question uh, in this same series. Will the men of Kyla deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So if you stay here and Saul comes, the people in this city that you just helped out from these Philistines who'd been raiding their stuff, they're going to just hand you over to Saul. So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Kila and went wherever they could go. And then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Kila, so he halted the expedition. Now hold on a minute. Wait a minute. What did Calvin say about foreknowledge? Calvin said, if God sees it, it's done deal. I just read something that wasn't a done deal. Hmm. Hmm. Look at that. God not only knows, knows, sorry. <laughs> How did I do that? God only knows what we will do, but what we might do in any given circumstance. He knew that if David hung out in Kyla, that Saul was coming one, and two, that the men of Kyla would give him up when they were besieged. And so what you get from this, I hope you can see, is that foreknowledge does not necessarily mean determination. Foreknowledge is just foreknowledge. He just knows what would happen, and he also knows what will happen. He knows the decision we end up making, right? Because he has all knowledge. He lets us make it. But he lets us make it. <laughs> Boom! Calvinism. There you go. Did that help you? Oh, yeah. And there's other scriptures, too. I think about the scripture that Jesus... Oh, gosh, where is this? Uh, Matthew 12... Uh, I think it's Matthew 12 where he's talking about or is it 11 where he's talking about uh, you know if the miracles have been done in woe to you Chorazin or Capernaum you know because the, the miracles that have been done in, in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah they would have they would have uh, you know <laughs> repented in sackcloth and ashes you, you remember what I'm talking about I'm, I may not be calling the right chapter but you, you remember the 
the verse, and y'all can correct me whether it's 11 or 12. I think it's 12. But anyway, um, he said, I know what would happen. If I were back there in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and I did the miracles that I've done here in the Gospels, they would have repented. He knows not only what will happen, but he knows what would happen under different circumstances, which tells me that we are still completely free to make our decisions and choices. Because we just read a passage where he said, if you do this, this is what will happen, but it didn't happen because they didn't do it. So foreknowledge does not have to mean determinism, which is what Calvin just said. Trap closed, boom. Okay? And, and I did that not with philosophy, but with Scripture. All right, now let's, let's do another one, okay, just for fun. I don't know how far we're going to get today because I'm having too much fun today with this because this doctrine just drives me crazy. Anyway, um, so let's let's uh, let's go to the next one. I mean, we you know we know that he has all knowledge, um, and now we'll look at this this next one, this next thorny deal that we got here, and that is uh, predestined. Um, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. He did predestine. Uh, and I would call this this you know the the uh, well the sovereign will of God. I put the supreme will of God. I don't know why I carried that over, but I did. Uh, but the Greek word is is prohorizo, from which we get our English word predestined or foreordain. And you know this is this is you know effectively um, the will of God. That God is determining things here and are brought brought to pass. God's saying, I'm determined to do something, and then he does it, and the Bible calls that predestination. And when God predestines something to happen, all hell can't stop it, right? When he decides that that's, that's the way it's going to go. And so he puts all his omnipotence behind it. And so here's the deal. Um, does that mean, if, you know, if you're predestined, that some are predetermined, and predestined to go to hell and that others are predetermined and predestined to go to heaven based on God's sovereign prior choice you know before the world began it doesn't necessarily follow because we've just blown up foreknowledge equaling determinism if we do that then we don't have to have predestined being something that happened you know in eternity past either but let's give the devil his time and we will allow him to speak. Here's what he says. By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or the other of these ends, we say that he has been predestinated to life or to death. Okay? So, that means logically following that total depravity, you know, you're depraved to the point that you can't respond to God, therefore you have to be given the faith to, to respond to God, therefore God chooses those to whom he grants the gift of faith Okay, and, and then therefore the atonement is limited. He didn't die for all. He only died for some. Therefore, when he does make that offer of grace, that offer of grace is irresistible. You can't resist it because you couldn't want it or receive it on the front end. So you're going to get it anyway because he's chosen that and predetermined that. And you will persevere because you you know you have no other choice but to. So that's your T U L I P and it all follows if this is true. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, I don't understand how that's by that the scripture that he does not desire for any to perish. Oh 
Okay, thank you very much for introducing the scriptures on the screen. There you go. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires wills in the King James all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then, uh, oh, sorry. And then I had uh, the other scripture. The Lord is, is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And then you remember Jesus pleading with these folks. In other words, they got a chance. And they were not what? Willing. Now why would he plead with them if it's all a sham? Why even send out preachers of the gospel except just to condemn people, to show that they're reprobate? That's what they say, by the way, the Calvinists. Uh, just to show that they're reprobate, they reject the message, just to show that they're not one of the elect. Is that the character and the nature of God that you see on the screen right there? Is that the heart of Jesus Christ that you see on the screen right there? Who is begging these people, he's pleading with them with a salty tear running down his cheek. He is, a, he is pleading with all of his heart of love. You know, why would you not come and be saved? That's the God of the book. Definitely not the God in the Institutes. You, you got something? Joe, you, you were about to hold forth. Go. I was just thinking in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved some of the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how they, that's how they interpret it. There was, there's one guy, his name's R.C. Sproul, God rest his soul, he just died not long ago, but he likes to retranslate that and say that for God so loved the elect in the world, the elect of the world, that he gave his only son. They, they, they try to rewrite the Bible, guys. They want to rewrite the scriptures to fit their system. When we need to pulverize and crush the system, and trash the system and let the Bible speak for itself. Right? right. Why would God have made a way for the Gentiles? Because he had the Jews. Yeah. He had them do everything. That was the fact. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, then, anyway. Yeah. And, and that right there is the key really great insight because that's the key to understanding Romans 9 to 11 which is another one of these Jehovah's Witness type problem passages that they throw at you all the time these are some of their proof texts that they throw and essentially showing the election of Israel and then Israel's rejection of the gospel which made the way for the Gentiles to come into the kingdom but don't throw the Jews away because they still got a chance I mean that's the whole 9 to 11 of Romans but they use it to some convoluted scheme to talk about particular individualistic ele election how he loves one and hates another and it's just ridiculous it's completely out of context what you said the broad sweep of that is the argument of Romans 9 to 11 which they completely ignore and we'll get to that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Paul, Paul says, I, I would give up my salvation if my people could be saved. That's how much he loved them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it don't make any sense. Yeah, no. No, it really doesn't. And, and then you get this, you know, the, the general uh, invitation in, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, you know, that everybody who wants to come can come. That's the heart of God. That's his heart for us. That's what he wants to do. And so, you know, the, the, the statement by Calvin is just, it's, it's ridiculous on its face when you compare it with the clear reading of Scripture. Now, some people think that, that, that if you say that we have a free will, um, that that takes away the sovereignty of God. But it does not. The Bible teaches both, doesn't it? In fact, do you, do you realize that sovereignty is actually a temporal attribute, not an eternal attribute of God? Uh-oh, I just messed with some minds. Um, 
and here's why I say that. Because God has not had anyone to reign over until creation happened. When he was eternally existent as Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, he had the eternal attribute of omnipotence. He's almighty, right? But only when he became the creator and therefore the sovereign ruler did sovereignty come into play because he had no one that he was directing, commanding. Do you see what I'm saying now? You can breathe, right? <laughs> I said God's not sovereign. He, he wasn't sovereign before the creation. He was omnipotent. Once the creation happened, he became sovereign. But his sovereignty, he cho the, of all the ways that he could have chosen to create the world and rule over it providentially, he chose to limit his purview of possibly just meticulously um, deciding every detail. He could have done that. He could have created a universe in which you and you and you and you and you and you and you were puppets. We had no will of our own. We had no autonomy. We had no free choice, no free will. And that's the world that Calvin has created in his institutes. And I'm going to show you it's based on a heresy called Gnosticism. But that's for another lesson and for another day. Yes? You were just talking about what you just said about God. Time's relevant to him. Right. So, I mean, time is something we've got here on this earth. Right. What you said, I, I just, I'm a little off on that one. Because yeah, omnipotence, yeah, yeah. Omnipotence is another word for sovereign. It really is. It's another word for it. Yeah, I do. Right, right, right. But um, anyway, but in his sovereignty, the point I was going to make is, is that the way he chose to exercise his sovereignty is to allow us the ability to choose which means he has to pull back on what he could do potentially as the omnipotent God he could have made a universe where you didn't have any free will no choice no nothing and he could have meticulously determined every detail and they'll talk about that it's 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 just like the Stoics believed in the universe that every detail every atom that moves every breath you take every heartbeat all of it everything is directed by God which then makes God the author of Sin. yes and therein lies the damnable part of the reformed teaching but he didn't do that he created a universe in which free creatures can make stupid decisions and sin and as a result of our sin all kinds of evil is unleashed in the world that you can't pin on God because God is holy <laughs> God is sin less you can't even tempt him with sin James says right so under examination and scriptural contrast you can see that these doctrines do not hold up right I hope um, so we're, we're, we're not getting very far here I'm sorry I'm just having way too much fun with this stuff <clears throat> but what are we predestined I'll end with this what are we predestined to do to be saved what does he say what was the verse? Let me back up to it. And we'll go back to it. What are we predestined to do? To be conformed to the image of His Son. So God has a destiny for everybody who comes to know Him, which He's seen in the future. He's seen from eternity past. He knows who's going to receive Christ, who's going to repent of their faith, who's going to come to faith in Christ, decide to follow Jesus. He knows who you are. And what is, his, what is his destiny for you? It's not whether he picked or chose you to be saved or lost. He's predestined you to what? Be like, be like Jesus. Yeah. 
And, and, and so he kind of jumps here to the end of 30, where he says glorified, right? He jumps all the way to the end and tells that's what's going to happen. And Paul even goes through the process in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, doesn't he? He says a twinkling of an eye, whether you're in the grave and you're raised, or whether you're on the earth and alive and are left at the coming of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4, when he comes back and you're raptured, either one, doesn't matter, we're going to be changed. Hallelujah. Yeah. And we're going to be like him. Exactly. And so when we, he's talking about predestination here, it's not anywhere near what you read from Calvin, is it? It's just that God's destiny for you at the end of your salvation experience, when Jesus comes back, whether you're in the ground, you know, your body's in the ground and it's raised, or whether you're alive and left when he comes and the trumpet calls and you, you're taken up, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air no matter whether you're dead or whether you're alive his goal for you is the same he's going to conform you to the image of his son right and that's a process that the Holy Spirit is doing right now in your life he's working in you and we call that process what sanctification right being made holy right we're being set apart we're being being made more like Jesus day by day hopefully now for me it's it's uh, two steps forward and three steps back sometimes I don't know if it's that way for you but but hopefully we're making progress in our obedience to the Lord and but at the end of the day no matter how far we got in that process boom in that moment we're gonna be made like Christ and that is God's destiny for us not whether you're going to be picked and chosen and saved and lost because of some you know robotic <laughs> deal on the part of this distant deity that really is cold and calculating and doesn't care uh, which is what we heard from Calvin I think uh, totally different when you look at what Paul is trying to say here well I gotta quit let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and father we thank you for your word today we thank you Lord that your word gives clarity to the confusion that exists out there with all the teachers and all that they say and all the books and all the commentators and all the preachers um, who care more about studying the words of a man and making him their authority than they do reading the simple, clear, pure, unadulterated, authoritative, inerrant, infallible word that you gave us. Lord, we just pray that we could get to that and, not, and, and take the blinders off and take the colored glasses off and set the systems aside, Lord, and read your word and let your Holy Spirit guide us and teach us because you have promised us that he will lead us into all truth. And so, Lord, we just ask for that. We ask for that as we look at this, these dangerous doctrines that we're hearing about this taking over uh, what we love. And, God, we just ask for your favor and your blessing as we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week this week.